All throughout the American suburbs, you will find entire neighborhoods filled with nearly identical houses. But why does this happen? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. Today we are exploring the phenomena known as cookie cutter housing. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of this house. Before we explore why so many homes look nearly identical, we need to define the components of a cookie cutter house. These homes are built quickly, in large tracks, by the same developer who only offers a handful of house plans. By limiting the ability of the home buyer to customize their new house, the developer is able to build entire neighborhoods at an alarming rate. They use the same materials from the same suppliers on every new house they build, ensuring that the quality is always exactly the same. Oftentimes, because of this method of mass production and housing, this leads to lower costs for the home buyer. But the trade-off is living on a street without character, almost like every house was cut from a baking sheet using a cookie cutter. This is where we get the name, cookie cutter housing. Now that we know what we are talking about, how did this happen? Certainly, things weren't always this way, right? In the mid to late 1800s, the US saw its first population boom, with cities rapidly developing across the country. This led to small rows of similar houses being built by developers, though each one was able to be extensively customized. But by the turn of the century, this trend had mostly died down in favor of custom homes, filling residential streets with charming and unique houses, which allowed each suburb to really encapsulate its own aesthetic. But this highly customized way of living saw its downturn during the Great Depression, when new construction slowed to a halt. Now, the majority of new homes being built were being finished out with fewer details and more economical design choices. Just as the economy started to turn around, World War II broke out. This led to men being pulled out of the traditionally male-dominated workforce and most of the nation's resources being devoted to the war effort. When World War II came to an end, victorious veterans returned home and began starting families. Suddenly, there was a housing crisis. With fewer homes being built in the decades prior, the cities were becoming too crowded, so a handful of developers across the nation sought to capitalize on this problem of limited housing supply and excessive demand for new homes. The most famous of these developers was William J. Levitt with his construction company Levitt & Sons. He founded the all-white private neighborhood of Levittown on Long Island, New York, where he introduced a new way of building houses. He took an approach known as an assembly line, where each worker was trained to do one thing before passing off the product, in this case a house, to the next worker. Each house took 27 steps to complete and required 36 workers for its process. Each team of 36 workers could erect one house per day. This new concept became a sensation. Families who were living in crowded apartments could purchase a lot and in some cases, move into a new home the next day, instantly satisfying their housing needs. Within the first three hours of opening up their sales office, Levitt and Sons sold over 1,400 new homes. And over the next couple years, they built 17,000 single-family houses, with more than 84,000 residents calling the neighborhoods home. Though it was a financial success, the neighborhood was the center of controversy because of the bylaws in the Homeowners Association forbidding FHA loans to people of color for new construction, which created one of the largest segregated communities in the northern United States. Other developers across the country took notice of William Levitt's success and further simplified the process of home building. In Crestwood, Missouri, developer Burton Denke worked hand-in-hand -hand with architect Ralph Fournier to create some of, if not the first, modular single-family houses. Walls and entire roof sections were built separately, then assembled on site. They were primarily designed in the mid-century modern style, with clean lines and accommodations for technology that did not yet exist. Part of Fournier's philosophy was to create homes that could be easily adapted to new technology, allowing them to stand the test of time. He predicted that televisions would become larger, that open concept living would become more popular, and that technology that was yet to be invented would end up filling up our homes. People around the country loved this idea of building a house that could adapt to the ever-changing social landscape with minimal updates. So while Levitt and Sons had been successful in New York, Ralph Fournier saw worldwide success with his homes being built in 195 cities around the world. This caused other developers to take notice. With low cost, quick turnaround time, and high demand for housing, the market was ripe for massive, low-quality developments to fill the void in housing demand. By the 1990s, American suburbs from coast to coast looked nearly indistinguishable from one another, 
with most middle-class neighborhoods offering an average of eight variations of the same 150 house plans. Even upper-middle-class and lower-upper-class neighborhoods began to spring up, using the same low-quality materials and budget-friendly construction methods, creating super-cookie-cutter homes, also known as McMansions. People who could afford custom homes were now building large, low-quality houses falling into the same trap as their middle-class counterparts, with well-to-do streets repeating the same house over and over again. In the U.S., the only state to require an architect to design a house is the state of New York. In the 49 other states, most of these homes were designed by general contractors without background knowledge, on classical architectural orders, nor cohesiveness of styles, which has led to a couple of problems. First, these homes tend to be amalgamations, lacking alignments with random window placement, non-functional shutters, fake Juliet balconies, and turrets for no apparent reason. Of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but speaking to the mathematically based theories of architectural composition, these features appear to be random, almost mocking the profession. The second problem with homes being designed without the consultation of an architect is longevity. In the past, homes were built to last, to house generations of families for hundreds of years. But most of the homes in the United States built since 1990 have a life expectancy of only 50 years. Some buyers paid extra for quality materials, but the vast bulk of buyers went with cheap, builders-grade materials, including particle board and substandard weatherproofing between the walls. Given that suburban housing accounts for, on average, 57% of cities' metropolitan area housing stock that means that by the year 2040, most of these low-quality homes, regardless of their price tags, are expected to fail or be demolished. It isn't a question of if this happens, it's a question of when. When this happens, when the suburbs are torn down, what will replace them? Will metropolitan areas become ghost towns? Will they be abandoned like the once affluent suburbs of the Rust Belt? Or will millions of families take individual measures to maintain their cookie cutters? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you enjoy these videos and would like to show the world your support for This House, join our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.